Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, where we explore strategies for training, competing, and well-being shared through experiences from some of the sharpest minds in the fitness space. Now, now welcome, welcome your host, Micah Shoemaker. It's beautiful out here. The weather's great. There's so many things to do. It can be a little bit of a distraction, I'd say, but um, working on living a little bit more than just like working as much. You know what I mean? It's funny. I was so I, prior to getting on here, I was on a or I was in a uh, wormhole on Instagram, and I, I I try to only. This is like something that I've I've done, and I've noticed it works for me. If if I know I have to do something, like I have an appointment that I'm going to be at, but I have like five minutes, then I'm like mm-hmm. okay with going into the wormhole because I know like <laughs> I only have five minutes, so like I've got to right. snap out of it. So, yeah. uh, I was watching this thing. Uh, it was a Grant Cardone video, and he was like, "Man." He goes, life is meant to be spent, not saved. And I was like, damn, that's good. I love that. And I think, I, I, I know I get in this. It's like, uh, and it's, 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 it's so funny too because, and I'm, I'm trying not to just throw out these very cliche sayings and, and stuff, but like you really do find, in my opinion, what you seek in life. And it's funny because I've been trying to find, I think, a lot of, like the best word I can use is freedom. I think freedom from like doing, like having to do things like this way because that's just how it's been done for 30 years. Or, um, you know, just because someone tells you, Hey, you like, you've got to work 60 hours a week cause that's, what's going to make you successful or, right. or, and, and, and just, uh, so anyways, long story short, I've been having these conversations with my wife, with people around me. And it's so interesting in life in general, you find, what it is that you seek and yeah. it's just so cool that even this conversation started the way that it did yeah man absolutely i think that's the best part for me being out here in hawaii being able to actually get some time to think and being out mm. like going on a hike or like last week the hawaiian trail run was happening and the whole entire yeah. week i'm stressing out because because of the amount of work that i knew, knew i needed to get, to get done or i felt like i needed to get done and after be, building my business for the last five years feeling like when i'm not working am I actually doing anything to push the business forward? But the fact of the matter is if, if I take some time to sit back and like look at the bigger picture and just kind of relax a little bit, that's actually going to bring me back to where I started of really where I'm going to go and what the next step's going to look like. So all that time to think and like hiking through the woods or whatever it is, hanging out on the beach, it really actually was 10 times more beneficial than what I could have been doing in the office. It's crazy. I read this article today uh, and I can't think of the tech company, but it was a tech company in Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona. And they were talking about how um, they adopted a, the four day work week. And mm. th- there were all these different studies that they did uh, on them over the course of the year that they did that, that adopted that. And one of them was the, uh, I guess, surplus or the intake of new uh, applications, job applications. And mm-hmm. A lot of people said, well, you're going to attract lazy people. Ironically, the exact opposite happened. In fact, there, this is insane. This is insane. They saw an increase in job applications, inbound job applications of, wait for it, 230%. I think that tells us something as human beings. And this is, I'm Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not preaching. I'm I'm, I'm reminding myself of this, is I think (laughs) so many freaking times, I think like, man, if I just did more, if I just worked more and it's like, sometimes I agree that could be the answer. Um, you know, but I, I, and this is something that I've struggled with because I'm a very, and from our conversations, just very few of them, but I, I, you strike me as the same way is I'm very type a, I'm very like hustle until my face comes off, (laughs) like sleep when you're dead, all those things. (laughs) And, like, why am I that way? Like, self-diagnose yeah. me. I mean, yeah. and maybe I'm not the only one. I think, well, for me, the, the biggest transition that I've been going through recently is when I was building my business when it, when it first started, I was in the car, driving across the country, different gyms, building relationships, focusing yeah. on, like, the physical aspect of work. I could grind yeah. from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. actually just physically doing things. But then when I had to, like, pull myself away from doing, like, physical things where I could push myself into the mud, and had to actually do tasks that were 
focused on vision casting or thinking, that's when I was like, man, why am I not feeling like I'm accomplishing anything? Mm. It's not because I'm not accomplishing anything. It's just because the physical aspect of accomplishing a task is so much more rewarding mm. than the aspect of accomplishing a task that's a mental um, project that you have to work on to push something forward into a different direction. And mm. the gratification doesn't come as quickly as mm. taking a task and then finishing it and checking the box. It actually takes six, ten, seven, eight months as opposed to just like 10 seconds, right, to actually do something. But that's the best time is when we're actually doing things for the long-term gain than just the short-term satisfaction of an outcome that we can accomplish physically. Mm. So I, I want to rewind for a minute. What brought you to Hawaii? Because I, I, I know there's a lot of things that are very attractive yeah. about Hawaii, but then there's obviously the downside that everything has to be imported. So things are simply just more expensive. Um, yeah. Right. So <laughs> I, I saw the smirk on your face like you have no idea, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Well, the long story short is uh, my girlfriend uh, moved out here in January and I was tired of doing long distance. But the benefit of it was I knew at a point I had to pull myself out of the day to day operations of business so we could scale our business to a different to a different level. Because if I was still on the floor grinding, you know, when the business was, when the business needed money, I'd hop in the back of my car and start driving and making money. And that's what I would do for the past couple of years. Now I actually have to develop a plan to then accomplish a plan to lead a team to then go accomplish the task so that they can focus on the grassroots operation and building out those things on the floor. And I can focus on the bigger picture, which is building the business from an e-commerce perspective, production, manufacturing, managing those plus our manufacturers out in Los Angeles. So flying from Hawaii to LA is the same as flying from Ohio to LA. Plus I get to live you know, uh, in, in a place where I'm close to my girlfriend and just in a beautiful environment that it gets a different, more different perspective, right? Being in the, being on, in the East and in the Midwest, active word trends are actually coming from the West coast or the East coast and then kind of meeting in the middle. So you look at like Lululemon or Viore or these high-end activewear companies. Lululemon starts in Canada. Viore starts in San in California. Um, and then all the trends are coming this way. So even from a brand perspective, to be legitimate in the industry, you have to look a certain way. So for me, it was a, it was an opportunity for to get a different perspective on activewear and trends so that we could take something and then build it um, in a different way than we had from, from where we were just originally starting it up. So... Those are the benefits of being out here. Plus, the the Kiala Foundation is very well, which is who my girlfriend works for. The Hawaiian Trail is pretty well connected. Um, so, just building relationships with people that are connected to the foundation, and just being in a different place. Hawaii is a really big trendsetter for perspective on on fitness and health and lifestyle that gives a different perspective than being just in a small town in, in the Midwest in Ohio. So, man, where uh, where in Ohio were you from? Uh, Columbus, Ohio. So about uh, 35 minutes outside of Columbus, Ohio, a small town called Marysville, Ohio. I, I pretty much lived there my whole entire life up to this point. And then literally this first time I, got, I packed a, a suitcase, a book bag and my guitar, podcast equipment and headed out to Hawaii. That's all I have. I left a bunch of stuff at home, but it was pretty freeing. Dude, I'm fascinated. I <laughs> Again, another conversation that I've had with several people lately. We just had someone move here from Boston. And yeah. uh, was kind of in a bad situation. I was just like, hey, you should move here. The cost of living is way, way, way less. Yeah. Um, we can get you a way better job doing what you're doing. And, uh, you, know, it, you know, it'll be great. And, um, you know, I did the same thing uh, at 18. I moved from Birmingham, Alabama to um, Raleigh, North Carolina. Now, that's not as dramatic, say, as Ohio yeah. to Hawaii. And I'm, believe me, I'm not projecting that. I don't want to act like I am because I'm not. But yeah, yeah. Ne Maybe. but nevertheless, I'm still fascinated by anyone that can pick up and like just because, dude, people hate change. I mean, yeah. Yeah, if man. your favorite restaurant goes out, like just that change is 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 so disheartening. Yeah. Like it's so yeah. it, it's it, it's such a process that we go through as humans, and. Now I'm going to pick up, I'm going to go away from everyone and everything that I've ever known that's ever become, um, I don't know, satiating to me in some way that I have yeah. these emotional connections to. And I'm going to say, you know what, um, I'm going to go to some islands and yeah. I, I'm i trusting in this relationship it's going to work because, you know, yeah. God knows it can yeah. 
it cannot work as well. And I've right. I've had some of those, especially long distance. And this is not a <laughs> Dr. Phil podcast, so we're not going to get into those. Yeah, right. right? And, and, I, and I'm like, dude, like is – like, was there ever a, a, something that came in your mind? And, and I'm sure we'll get into the business thing. W- was there ever anything that came in your mind? You're like, dude, this could be a, a colossal mistake. Yeah, uh, for for certain. The the best part about it is I still got home base. I could go back. I don't like to really have a plan B. I, I've never really had a plan Burn B in business. That's the been- ships. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's part of building a business bootstrapped. You know, I, I've never had a plan B. It's just been like, this is plan A and we're going to keep going with plan A. And yeah. if we have to pivot a little bit, we will. But um, I, I could always go back. Um, but the commitment in moving forward was just a final a promise to myself that I was going to do things differently, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's what that's what I wanted to do. And and getting a different perspective and frame of reference. Honestly, my biggest fear was that the people that worked for me or that invested in the, their time into the company and building out what we have here um, was that they were going to think that I was kind of getting to a point of like, oh, you're too good for us. You moved to Hawaii to relive a ritzy lifestyle when it's really not what it looks like. I'm living on you know a thousand bucks a month or so right now and like that's what i'm allocating to to my living expenses um and figuring that out so it's not like i've made i didn't move because i have a ton of money i moved because i felt like that's what i needed to do it's not because it's like the business is great and things are moving. <laughs> i just want people to have that perspective so that was my biggest fear was that people are gonna think like oh you're just going and living over there and you don't care about us anymore when i worked my butt off for the last five years to get the business to the point of where it's at now, it's just, it was a strategic, really, it was a strategic business plan to help us to scale and give people ownership over their opportunities that we had back on the mainland um, and be closer to manufacturers. So yeah, it could have, it could be, and it's still un- unknown, you know, like it's been, I've been here for a month now. So it's still unknown whether or not it was, a mis- whether or not it's a mistake from a business perspective or life perspective, but I really believe that when you commit to something, you make it work no matter what, right? I mean, we talked, we, that was the first thing that you said when we got on the call was, you know, really making that decision and, and pushing your life in a certain direction. You make things happen, right? And if you commit and you say something, I truly believe, and this, is how, this has been the way in business and life and everything that I've, that I've seen and done, if you say something out loud, you will yourself to action, you will yourself to make it happen. Mm. Um, and I just, I'm just a huge advocate of that perspective because Say it out loud, make it happen no matter what. You're it's the accountability out loud. You're not just saying it to yourself, you're saying it to other people. And some people can be like, Oh, you're you're kinda arrogant, or that's a that's a that's a poor perspective to have. It's like, no, I'm saying this because I really believe that if I do this, I'm aligning with my purpose for life, but I'm also I'm also giving myself accountability to taking that step because I believe that that step is actually going to help more people in the long run. And that's what we're here to do anyways. So if we can be just advocates for other people to do things that are challenging or outside of their comfort zone and saying like, I would have never done that. Like then you're on the right path because you're making change in the world that needed to happen anyways. Mm. Wow. I so I didn't realize you'd been there a month. That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> I, I was like, maybe because well, you know what I, excuse me, when I met you at, was it Mac, um, yeah. Dex had said something to me like, oh, you know, he's, he's moving to, and, and, and I, and I don't know, I guess in my head I was like, oh, you know, he's, he's been living there. And then this was totally not the case. It's like, you just moved there. Um, yeah. which is even crazier to me. Like what's, yeah. I, I, I think people would be interested. Like what's in the month that you've been there, what do you like? I mean, are the I mean, obviously the people are the, are the same to some extent. I mean, it's not like yeah. they speak a different language over there. Um, it's you know, they still speak. Some do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. But like, so far, what is your what has your experience been like? It's been good, man. Um, the biggest thing is just being able to figure out what life looks like in the next in the next couple of steps, right? Trying mm-hmm. to find a car, trying to figure out best place of best place to work. You know, I'm not going to the office like I would back at home, right? Um, just being able to balance out the two different things of the work aspect, six-hour time difference back to the East Coast and communication with my team, um, not being able to go out to different events or being able to travel as much as I did previously. This is the first time in the last five years that I've been in the same place for, you know, a month. Like, I've always moved around or gone to different states, competitions, events. So this is the longest time that I've actually been landed in one place. So, you know, island fever is real, getting a little, you get a little stir crazy and you want to book a trip somewhere else just to kind of take, keep yourself moving. But it's really just 
the biggest thing that I'm learning right now is the aspect of being disciplined when there's nobody else around you pushing, mm. helping you to push the ball forward. Cause you, I'm on an Island, but you truly do feel like you're on an Island from that perspective. Cause you really, really have to lock in on discipline because nobody's telling you what to do. People are off. My employees are off work by 11 AM. I got the back end of you know the day to, to do what I need to do creatively, but it's easy to just say, Hey, let me go, let me go on a hike or let me go, you know, let me go surf or learn how to do like swim or whatever. It just, it doesn't matter. Just the aspect of discipline. And I think that's where I'm really getting, um, I'm really learning that about myself is how to be disciplined when there's no accountability around you to taking the next step forward. Mm. And people don't really know what you're doing, right? They don't know if you're working, they don't know if you're pushing the ball forward, but just being disciplined to yourself and being accountable to the goals that you have, no matter what the situation or scenario is. Um, so that's really what it's been like for me. Um, and it's, it's been a joy and a different perspective because this is something that I would have never expected. If you would have asked me five years ago, like, Hey, are you, I'm going to, you're going to move to Hawaii on year five and build your business. And you're going to trust your team to take care of it back, back there, because this is what you really believe you need to do to help the business in longevity. Um, I would have said you're crazy, but <laughs> we did it and, and we're here. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I, you know, I love when people take take those risks. You know, um, and and I think it's you know, my, man. My, my wife and I are talking about this. It's like it's you know, you, it's not just about taking risks. It's about it's about in some capacity. I think being calculated about those risks. You know, if um, you know, obviously I'm I'm married, so I'm, so I've, I've got some things to think about uh, or another yeah. person I should say to think about, but like we don't have kids. So like I can right. take some risks now. I can do some things yeah. that maybe, it, you know, if you had a little Johnny over there, you're like, look, little Johnny's <laughs> got to eat his, you know, weedios or whatever. You know? It's like <laughs> shit, man. Like he's going to starve, you know? Right. Like, so I, I know I'm it's tongue in cheek, but like, you know, those things run through your head, man. It's like, right. it's like, f- screw it. If I, if I F up, I'm, I'll just, I'll just figure it out. Like it's, you know, it's just me, yeah. you know? And I mean, um, yeah. I, I think that's like a really, you know, interesting thing. It's also interesting, you know, because, um, you know, I had seen you guys brand. I had seen uh, you know, some things that you'd been involved in specifically at the semifinal level was, was where I got some, or a lot of exposure to you guys and God, what a blessing that was because we would have maybe never had this conversation if I hadn't shaken your hand at yeah, Mac and then be like, Hey, remember that guy, you know, the Hawaii guy. Um, yeah, Ryan. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and it, you know, obviously there is, there's Under Armour, there's Noble, there's, um, uh, I don't know, uh, Nike, there's uh, yeah, Rory, like, like Lulu, like we've named a bunch of people. When you're getting into the lifestyle and apparel space, does that ever deter you? Does that ever go, man? There's a lot of freaking players in this thing, and and good ones, and and, and good yeah. ones. Yeah. I mean, right? And a lot of good ones, not just a few, not just one. It's not just like, there's Nike or there's Lulu. It's like there's a bunch of good ones, um, and then there's a bunch of good ones in the CrossFit space. Like, does yeah. that ever did that ever deter you? Like, man, I don't think I need to do this. Like, almost like imposter syndrome. Like, I'm not good enough. Like, I don't like. I, I mean, I'm 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 saying those things because those are all the things that I've. I've felt it's like, well, no one needs another podcast about CrossFit, you know, like, yeah. like I'll tell myself that I'm just curious if you ever felt that way. Yeah. Well, I would say imposter syndrome in the aspect of building a business and a company. I, I would say no, from that perspective, maybe in my personal life as a, as an entrepreneur or a business owner, not from the yeah. business idea itself. Um, I read a book when I was in college and it was called blue ocean strategy. And it just talks about how, when you have, uh, when all the sharks are in the water, you know, the, the, the water's bloody, it's red, right? But then the good ideas are the ones where it's smooth sailing, you know, blue ocean is out there, there's no sharks in the water, there's not a lot of competition. So I always looked at business from that perspective. How do we do something that is longevous? And we've kind of elected to do things that are going to take 10 times more time to accomplish, but are going to be 10 times more rooted in longevity than just doing the you know, the normal route of taking an athlete and sponsoring them and paying them and leveraging a following or putting tons and tons of money into paid advertisements because you have investors or putting tons of money into products and testing products and then getting feedback from customers and longevity. Our goal was really just to go to the local communities and build relationships and focus on building a really, really strong foundation that, Mm -hmm. you know, is going to take longer to scale, but in longevity, it's going to have more roots 
because we're focused on the community and the people at at that level. We're going to build a lot more trust, right? Mm -hmm. To a company that is really, really big, their brand is recognized just based on being seen a lot of different places. If you look at our social media following, every single person that follows us is, is likely a person that we have legitimately shaken a hand with and said, would you follow us on Instagram at an event? Right. That's part of our strategy. Right. We haven't put a lot of money into paid advertisements. We haven't put any money into athlete sponsorships. Um, we don't do a, a ton of different advertising in places other than in local fitness communities. But that's where I believe the longevity is because people see you over and over and over again. And they don't only see your brand, but they see your brand with a face that's smiling right next to it. <laughs> that leaves an impression that is more longevous than just an advertisement of a, of a great athlete that's on social media that actually has a time period for what which they're going to be popular. They're popular for as long as they're good at the sport of fitness, which is which is totally okay. And I think that is incredible to be very, very great at something. And I aspire to be the same way. But it turns over and then it gets to a point as a brand to where you actually leave, the brand has to make a decision. Is this athlete no longer popular? So let me just fire them because they're no longer popular and and move on to the next most popular person, which isn't really building relationships in the long run. It's leveraging an individual that's good at something, which is what part of advertising and marketing is. But from my perspective, how do we build relationships that are longevous and that build a, a lifetime of value rather than just short-term gain um, let's build long-term impact in brands. And it's going to take me 20 years to build this to where I want it to go. But I wouldn't want to do it any other way because the authenticity and what we're trying to create actually is going to provide a better outcome um, where we're not just around for 10 years and then kind of slowing down. Like we're kind of just picking up, mm. picking up the pace by that point. You know what I mean? Um, so that's kind of my perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think there is something to a grassroots think um i mean you look at crossfit when it started i mean that's exactly what it was it was uh you know uh, people like uh, you know firefighters and police officers did it as a as you know a way for their training and you know then other people saw it as well these guys are really awesome these guys are badass in what they do yeah. let me do it you know and i and and then you know this whole this whole sport of fitness thing came way later but that's a different conversation yeah. uh so i i I, I get that. And it was for the most part of, you know, it didn't just blow up overnight. Um, you know, the, the thing was a kind of a slow burn type of deal. It, it's, it, it's interesting though, because to me, I think about things from a marketing perspective and I know you do too. So this is why mm -hmm. this is kind of fun. And for people listening, I'm sorry, you're going to have to just deal with this. Maybe you'll learn something while we talk a little bit yeah. of marketing here. Uh, but I, I've always said on, on podcasts, I don't, I don't talk about what people want to here I just talk about things I like to talk about and if people find that interesting so be it uh yeah. it's the it's the Ryan husband's slow trajectory uh you know <laughs> I'm just kidding. yeah uh, <laughs> so <laughs> anyways uh you should trademark that uh so my question is this <laughs> why it to me it makes the most sense to align yourself with people uh that most represents your brand, whether that's yeah. from an aesthetic, a morals, beliefs, values, whatever thing you determine as the North Star, there you have it. And it seems like, at least from my perspective, outside looking in, uh, and obviously I know your perspective would be different because you have more knowledge than I do about this. From a brand standpoint, it looks and appears to me that every brand and their mama that can afford to do this, this being pay an athlete to wear their, you know, support their stuff does that. I mean, you saw even a brand like, uh, we'll take hustle made, right. That was kind of just like an internet brand for the longest of time. And then finally right. they switch over and get some athletes. Right. So right. like, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, like, do you ever look at that and go, well, maybe, maybe we're making a mistake or maybe this mm -hmm. is the way forward. Or you're just like, I really believe yeah. that like talking to people in local boxes is, like this is gonna yeah. this is gonna pay off. Yeah. So I'm not saying that we will, will never bring on an athlete. Up until this point, that's been the way that we built the business. As we've gotten our product line to a place of being competitive to other companies as well, and having depth in the product line to be able to say, "Hey, here's an athlete. They're going to wear all of our products all the time. We have multiple different types of products that they can wear when okay. they're competing, when they're hanging out, whenever they're doing what they're doing." So. 
part of our part of our long term perspective would be yes, absolutely. We're actually working on a project right now to start bringing on some new, some athletes into the brand because that's going to be part of our strategy moving forward. Mm-hmm. Um, but we haven't had we haven't had the value enough to feel like we were ready to provide value to an athlete to build that. longevity with them yeah. instead of just coming to them and saying, hey, here's what we have here and promising them something. I want to actually have something that's of of worth to them to see and have a perspective on. And I, I really think the way that the way that the way that athlete sponsorships are trending, if you look at the way social media is right now, gone are the days that brands are literally just using athletes to build their brand because the conversion on athletes or conversion on social media is just not there. Right? You you look back on Instagram and when it like, you know, first post that you put up, they're getting tons and tons of engagement, but people are seeing hardly any of your stuff and there's really no incentive to build you're following other than just for legitimacy to the eye, right? For somebody to see it, right? You're not, there's the conversion rate's not higher and tons of brands are actually seeing this right now. And from, from what I'm seeing, brands are dropping the, the value that they're providing for athletes because the way that they did it wasn't actually providing them the ROI that they needed to have in longevity because they thought that if they just sponsored an athlete, then they were going to, their conversion rate was going to absolutely dramatically skyrocket. And I think that there's a way that we can help athletes because it's a big it's a big thing in the industry for athletes to get paid and want to get paid. And our our industry in the grand scheme of sport and fitness is is it's big. But if you look at you know a following of of like the best athletes in the industry, it's it's a couple million followers as opposed to like LeBron James in the NBA who has 23, 24 million followers. So if you look at our space, it's not massive by any means. These people are very very good at what they do in sport, but how do we provide something that can create longevity in sponsorships rather than just, Hey, here's an athlete. Here's a, here's a bait. Here's a salary. Here's a code. You can make some commission on when they're not making any commission on that code anyways, because nobody's purchasing through that code. Right. Mm. It's just, I'm not seeing, I'm seeing a transition in the way that we're seeing these things. And I think the, the value that we need to provide to actually level up and capitalize on athlete sponsorships is going to look a little bit different and more strategic in longevity as social media trends into a different direction. Yeah, that's, so what you just said, I am having conversations with people right now about this this idea that, you know, uh, from example, Instagram, right? It, the engagement is, um, you know, 50% less automatically off the jump if you post a photo, if you post a, if you post a still photo, right? Yeah. They wait, vertical video specifically, and now I think that's all they'll let you post, yeah. um, or it or it just takes it as a vertical and it, you know whatever, but it's black on uh, the top and bottom. Uh, and that's fascinating to me. Uh, the other thing that's fascinating to me is this idea that your feed is not going to be the people that you engage with or that you want to engage with or that you follow. It's going to be, as they put it, um, a discovery or creator space driven right feed so with those thoughts in mind because what you just said i think is 100 percent true it's like the brands aren't seeing the roi on these athletes because those posts aren't getting through like yeah. let's just be honest and i'm so I'm, I'm curious to see how instagram and how not just instagram but social is going to change as a result of that yeah, um, I would agree, and that's part of, that's part of the way that, um, as I talked about building a business with authority and you know grassroots, that's never going away. Imagine if you literally just snapped your fingers and social media wasn't in existence tomorrow, right? Where does your brand go? Where does your recognition go, right? So it's actually this is the only Plan B that I've created in the way of building business is is this is what we have to to go back to. If this is non-existent or if this isn't the way that we're strategically operating, right? The past, you know, 10, 15 years, people, brands have grown on social media and they've, they've used it to leverage a platform. But I think there's transitions that are going to happen in the future that is going to be a rude awakening for people that haven't built that authority in longevity. Because even all these athletes that have a huge followings on social media, what happens if, you know, I have a buddy who's his, his account, like, literally got got locked and had a like he wasn't able to use his account anymore and he had a couple hundred thousand followers and then all of his sponsorships are gone just because of that like is that really secure (laughs) like do you have like a a, you know do you have 
Instagram on speed dial to, to change that when that happens to you. Like that's your whole entire life and you're basing it on an app inside of a phone, right? So what happens in those situations when those things happen? You know what I mean? Like that's wow. kind of a, you know? So how do we how do we come back to something that we actually have value and weight with something that is never going to leave, right? So, and that's relate. That's really comes down to relationships and your network outside of your social network. Mm. Yeah, man. I, look, you know, we had a, uh, we'll call I, I, and we talked a little bit about this on our phone call. We had a challenge where, you know, some people didn't get some shirts or some tanks or whatever, and, you know, there were there was there was like an option. It was like the option was uh, you know at the competition that we hosted the you know it, it, you know the option was you know you can just kind of just brush it under the rug and just act like it didn't happen, or you can do what I think I and I would hope that most people would do. To back to your point about building that relationship or building those relationships, is personally reach out to these people, and mm -hmm. if nothing else, freaking apologize. You know yeah, and. Right. It, it right it, it, and, 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 and and you know we did a few more things but point being is you know, I, I don't I don't say that to be like oh he's a good guy or whatever no it's like no this was a really shitty situation I hate it happened it, it was incredibly embarrassing and I I, I just want to like you know put my head under the covers because it is it's super embarrassing I can't believe it happened but the point is to your point there is an opportunity to build these relationships one on one and I think get involved in your local communities like whatever that looks like in crossfit i think it's a little bit easier or the crossfit space because like you can go to a box you can go to a competition and like you're seeing the same people literally over mm -hmm. and over and over right. some of our my wife and I's best friends we have met at competitions and we've invited them to come stay at our house when they're coming through town or we're going this weekend with a, a hand literally a handful of them down to um you know, Pensacola beach, right? Like it's, it's, it's these opportunities and to build relationships. And I think right. that is, that is what really sets these competitions, these brands, these apparel companies, these lifestyle mm -hmm. companies apart. And it's like, man, no one's freaking doing that. I don't think they're doing that. And maybe there's people from noble out there in the community. I don't know, giving free shoes to the yeah. streets of Boston. And I don't know about it. And if they are, good on you yeah. keep doing that shit yeah, that's right. freaking awesome yeah. but yeah you kind of get you kind of get my vibe yeah 100 percent, man um and i just i think the more that we look at like part of uh part of our brand is you know the aspect the lrx means live prescribed and the whole idea is the prescription for life is purpose you know when you have purpose you have a sense of value a sense of worth and it makes you feel mm -hmm. like you're yeah. giving back right we all have those yeah. things that that we do that give us a sense of purpose right and, mm -hmm. and and without that we you know we're depressed anxious individuals that don't know what to do with our lives because yeah, it do, things don't make sense without it right that's why we work out that's why we have jobs that's why we we go serve in the local community or we have relationships or friendships because we need that sense of purpose and i think outside of that you just you don't live life to the fullest potential or the, the fullest ability um, so that's kind of, you know, why we do what we do. And among that community, our goal is that we would bring around people throughout the brand, whether that's athletes, community members, our employees, people that work for us, that they would come around it and encourage people the same. For me, the reason I started my company was I was, you know, 19 years old. I was struggling with anxiety and depression. I was suicidal. I was sitting on the front porch with my mom. I was told I was going to take my life. And it was because I didn't have a sense of purpose. I just quit college soccer. My parents were getting a divorce. I was in a relationship, mm -hmm. came to an end. You know, my gr my grandma passed away. All those things happened at one time, and I was really just pleading for some understanding. And and the outcome of that was, you know, the, my pain needed to be used for purpose and impact. So I started my company so that I could help other people to understand the same thing. And I realized that in community and relationships, we get a sense of purpose. And I wanted to be, create something that would call people to action. That whenever they wore our brand or when they were around the community, that they felt called to action to actually live their life the way that they were designed to too many people are working nine to fives they hate and doing things that they don't enjoy because they're strapped to something that society told us we needed. Mm -hmm. So how do we create something that brings value back to the world and brings purpose into our lives that push forward this world that we want to see look differently or change 
every day and get one step better every single day. And along that road, bringing people with us to get to where we want to be, right? And that's what that's what life's like, and that's why we work out, and that's why we're involved in the communities we're involved in because they're evolving and changing into better versions of where our world was, right? So um, that's that's my perspective on on that. So. Mm. Man, I, you know, there's this, Jordan Peterson says this. I don't know if you follow him at all. Um, yeah. If you, yeah, I mean, if you don't, it's a, for anyone listening, it's a great follow. It's worth the, it's definitely worth the follower count there. But, uh, you know, he says something that really resonates with me. And I thought about this when you said it, <clears throat> you know, he talked about being miserable in life. He said the most mm-hmm. dangerous thing is being miserable, knowing that you're miserable and continuing to stay miserable despite that thought yeah. and right right and, and 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 like when you said the whole nine to five thing i was like oh my gosh yeah. he i literally saw yeah, yeah. yeah i saw a video on that yesterday and i and it just it like resonated with me because i think and look i get it like you know people are listening like well, i got bills to pay i got i got things to do and it's like yeah it's freaking scary and like I'm like I'm like I'm kind of going through, you know, something similar now with, with 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 trying to figure some of that stuff out. It's like, you know, money's great, man. Like, it, it is, and it provides you some things for sure. I'm not mm-hmm. arguing that point, yeah. and, and I, I yeah. it's it's asinine too. However, you have to look at your life at some point, and 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 really not like oh kind of no really look in the mirror. And ask yourself, like, am I really happy? Mm-hmm. Like, not, not, not like, do I yeah. put on this brave face and go to the world and on my social media? But no, like, deep down inside. And what? This, this could change someone's life. Like, what would I need to change to truly mm-hmm. be happy? Yeah. And I, and I just think that, like. W- I, and here's the deal. I don't think that it's because people aren't courageous, so they won't ask themselves the, themselves the question. I don't think it's that. I think it's if they did ask themselves the question, they wouldn't be okay with the answer. Like it, like yeah. it would like burn. It would be like kind of like money burning a hole in your pocket, or if you're about to engage or, mm-hmm. or get engaged, and in, 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 you know you're a, you're a dude, you're about to engage to your you know a, you know potential wife. You know, it's like the, the ring burns a. Hole. It's it's the same concept. It's like yeah. it's like. There's this seed that's been planted, and all of a sudden that seed starts sowing all types of junk. And, you know, man, I just found this in my own life. It's like I don't want to look back and when I'm 50, and I mean this like ties it all back together. Like life is meant to be spent, not Mm -hmm. saved. I don't want to look back when I'm 50 or 60 and go, I literally wish I could. I could, I could press the reset button and do this thing over because God, do I want to do it over? And, and I just, you know, I'm, and it's, and I get it. Most people are like, I, I, I just can't make the change. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm so empathetic to people that are in really like genuinely terrible situations. And, and, and I don't, I'm not an expert, so I don't know what to say to those people. I'll I'll be very honest. I, I, I just don't, I can only speak from my own experiences, but I just know when I, and thinking about this stuff, I'm thinking about making changes in my life and 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 doing these things and stepping out uh, on a ledge, whether it's starting a business or starting a competition or leaving a nine to five that's super stable so that you can do the things that, as you say, that really set your heart on fire. Like, it's so uncomfortable. Like, it literally makes me wake up in the night and I'm sweating, like profusely. Like, mm-hmm. probably need to go see a doctor. <laughs> okay. And yeah. like beam is not working for me. All right, beam. Yeah. So you need to send me some more stuff because the first bag did not work. I did two scoops. It didn't work. Right. But that's like, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm always trying to get sponsored on this podcast. Um, so, but it's like this mental, like, um, I think Alex Hormozzi calls it like these attention knots, right? Mm-hmm. That are that are wound so tightly in your head that simply you can't overcome them unless you confront them. Mm-hmm. Confronting yeah. I'm not happy, confronting that relationship that you never said I'm sorry. Um, you mm-hmm. know, do, you know, just 
knowing in your head, hey, I didn't do the right thing in that situation, or hey, I, you know what, I, I really could have just said, hey, that's on me, and taken responsibility, yet I didn't, and I lied about it. Like, whatever the case is, it creates all these mental knots in your head. Yeah. It's like it's like breaking up with a girlfriend and keeping the mm-hmm. freaking, you know, socks that she gave you. And I know it's a weird example, yeah. but it's like, it's you think about it. It's sadistic, yeah. but you never yeah. throw them damn socks away. Throw the socks away, right. people. <laughs> I love it. I think uh, comforting complacency is, is addicting, and that's why people people stay where they're at. It's it's so addicting just to look to wake up every morning and have everything the way the nice way the way that you had it. But if you're if you're feeling comfortable in the place that you are, you're you're not in the right spot. Like mm. realistically, we always need to step outside of that zone to where we're feeling comfortable and and get into that next step. Because how are you gonna, how else are you gonna level up or how else are you gonna call other people to to do the same thing, right? Mm. Walk, walk outside of that zone and, and into a new place that's going to help you flourish and take the next step in life. And we always know the answer. We always know what we need to do. We just act like we don't know the answer and we just stay where we're at. Like if you were to ask somebody and they were to be brutally honest with you, they would tell you, yeah, I need to do this, but I haven't made the decision. It's been five years. <laughs> like realistically, they know the answer, right? But they, they just, they are not willing to do it. And I think it's, it comes from a fear and this happens in my own life, but it comes from a fear of failure or feel mm. of not not living up to that potential, or not looking good out externally, mm. or it's not the same you know two hundred thousand dollar a year job that I had before, and I'm taking a huge pay cut, and I can't drive the car I want to drive, or have the house that I want to have, or buy buy the clothes I want to have. But I act like that's my happiness when realistically that's not your happiness. Stepping outside of that comfort zone and going into the next step, um, and doing the thing you know you've been called to do, or know you're supposed to be doing, is going to make you ten times happier because none of that other stuff provided satisfaction anyways. So, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that there's always constantly something working against us and we, we work against ourselves and the things mm-hmm. that we know we need to do because of this aspect of friction that doesn't, that doesn't feel comfortable making that transition and it's holding us back and it's pulling us back. And we think that that friction means we got to step backwards, but it really just means push through and make it happen. It's like a workout. You go into the gym and you work out. You have friction every single day. You have yeah. friction from the time that you put your shoes on. You have friction from the time that you step outside the door and decide, what's my attitude going to be when I go to this training session? You have mm-hmm. friction when you try to decide, am I going to do the whole entire workout or am I going to do half of it, right? And how? And then friction when you have to decide, how am I going to approach it? Am I actually going to work hard or am I just going to kind of go through the emotions or go through the motions, right? Um, so, you know, comfort and complacency is addicting and... Um, when you get to that point of stepping outside your comfort zone, there's going to be friction, but you just got to keep pushing through it because on the other end of that is just a life better than you're living now. Mm. I love this Tony Robbins quote that that says, uh, the pain that you know is more comfortable than the pain that you do not know. That's good, man. That's good. And it goes to your point about comfort and complacency. It goes to your point about it's just easier to stay the same sometimes Mm -hmm. and it doesn't rock the boat. It, Mm -hmm. uh, it falls in line with what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go to school. You're supposed Mm -hmm. to get a four year degree. You're supposed to, you're, 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 we all question (laughs) our beliefs except the ones we Mm -hmm. really believe in. And those (laughs) we never think to question. Right. Let that sink in. Yeah, man. And, yeah, I, do. I right like I just started to ask myself questions. It's like, like, do I believe this because someone told me to believe it, or do I believe it for myself? Do I hold these truths self-evident, or am I believing them mm-hmm. on behalf of you because I believe that's what yeah. I should do, or that I ought to do, or that it makes me fall in line right. to do? Mm-hmm. It makes me fit yeah. in. It it, it, yeah. it gives me acceptance into this thing, and mm-hmm. I this is a very um, large rabbit hole, so you can take this however you want to take it. But <laughs> I, I just started to ask myself those questions. And like, really, like, why do you believe that you need to make this amount of money? Why do you believe that you need to work this amount of money? Like, like, really start to push up against that stuff. And to your point, find what makes you freaking happy. And it's like, yeah, like, ask again, to back to the point I made earlier, it's like, when's the last time you sat and looked at yourself in the mirror and most people never do this. Uh, they're too afraid of themselves. Uh, right. Or afraid of what right. come out. <laughs> they're afraid of what, what come out. 
and ask yourself, why do I believe this? And I just think, uh, and am I happy? And I just like, I, like I've been down that journey here lately and it's scary as hell. I'm going to be very yeah. honest, but gosh, is it, it, is it freeing when you mm-hmm. actually, and you said this earlier, man, you said this earlier and it was so good. And I didn't want to stop you because you were saying so many good things, but you said when you say it out loud, there's something so yeah. powerful and palpable about saying things aloud. It's, mm-hmm. it, it becomes like, mm-hmm. like a third arm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, man, I, I believe in that act of saying something, in the act of saying something out loud. That's that's the biggest thing that I would encourage anybody listening to this too is say what you want to accomplish out loud and then make and then commit to action towards that goal and don't look back because the outcome will be even better than you anticipated and thought um, and it realistically will happen. Hmm. So, all right, you... You talked about being on your, I think you said your parents' porch. Uh, you said your parents were getting a divorce. A- a- mm-hmm. And man, I, like I like we could go down a whole like podcast on divorce. My parents got divorced. I don't know what age. What, I think you were, you told me you said 19, correct? Yeah. Yep. So mine was a little bit younger. I was 8, 9, 10 years old, somewhere in that ballpark. And mm-hmm. uh, so a, a little bit different there, but still old enough to very much understand what was happening. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's fascinating about kids with parents that go through divorces at ages that they can understand the difference of, of, of how that affects you. And you just don't realize how formative those uh, adolescent years are in not just yeah. your brain development, but your emotional development. And I think that's very fascinating. So um, that that's that's one thing I I I kind of picked up there. Second thing that I picked up was was it at that point like you sitting there on the porch or at what point did you go, "Hey, I'm going to pivot from this way of thinking, this mm-hmm. emotional state, this mental state." Like how did you get from that on the porch to let's launch a company and not just any company, but I want to do a lifestyle company, a lifestyle parent, yeah. like where bridge that gap. That just seems like a crazy gap for me. Yeah, man. Well, I found, I found a lot of purpose in fitness and for me, you know, playing soccer my whole entire life, I was really good at it. Um, and during that time I, I got to a point, you know, having played and played college soccer, I got to a point where I was no longer going to be able to play anymore. I transferred, um, from a two year institution from a four year institution D2 to another school that I was going to play at to play, I was going to play college soccer at. And the coach said I was going to, I was fine. I was eligible to play everything like that. And he basically told me, Hey, you're going to have to sit out a year and a half. And this was the spring by that time. So I would have to sit out to that spring and then finally to the fall to be able to play. And I wasn't a guy that really loved practice. I was a guy that really loved showing up on game day and and playing. I'd work (laughs) hard. I worked out like, like I didn't love, I didn't love soccer practice. I, I love working out. I worked out every single day since I was, you know, I've, I've worked out five or six times a week since since I was 12. But like, I've loved that process. I love the refining aspect of it. Maybe I just like the the aesthetic that comes with it. I don't know what it is, but it's uh, it's more so just as that happened, I realized I'm like, man, I don't know anybody at this new school, right? My girlfriend and I had just broken up. Like all this stuff had happened, and I wanted to do something that was gonna take that I really did just to take that pain and, and impact other people with it so I wanted I uh, basically I love the idea of this prescription for life which is purpose right like that's literally if you align with purpose in your life that's going to give you the, the the freedom to do the things you need to do yeah. and I just I had that that just clicked into my mind of like this is what this is where I was this is where I am now this is my perspective how do I share this with other people so I started off as the brand was called Living RX Fitness, and I was actually going to open a gym because I, I had perspective and actually had bought all the equipment to open a gym. So I started creating T-shirts because I wanted to brand myself in that area to, to start opening up a gym. So I made some T-shirts, printed on some stuff, worked with a local screen printer, and for about a year we were called Living RX Fitness. And then I realized, well, we're selling a lot of activewear, and I don't really like coaching CrossFit that much, <laughs> and so I don't think the gym route is going to be the one for me. Plus. 
I don't really, I like the idea of being able to move around and travel and be a lot of different places. So having a gym in one local community wasn't going to really do it for me. I wanted to be able to go a lot of different places and share the same message as opposed to being like static in one place because I like to move around a lot. So I started kind of liking the idea of activewear for the first couple of years. It was just like, how do I bounce around to different places, meet, meet people, build relationships. And I would say up until the mid the Mac, when we sponsored the Mac, um, not this past year, but the year before that was when it started to click of like, this is the route that we want to go mm-hmm. in terms of like really building out our branding and the aesthetic of it, the aesthetic of it. And the, the idea of like the prescription for life and, you know, our, our little prescription logo, which is right here. Um, mm-hmm. and just that, that perspective. Um, so that was kind of the transition, but to get there took a lot of time because I had no clue what I was doing. I had no background in active wear, no bra- back. I didn't work like I didn't even have background in any job. I've never worked a job in my life other than I mean my business, running my business. But I hadn't worked for another company or anything like that. So the transition wasn't like I had some prior evidence. It was literally just five years of I felt like education to get to where we are to finally start because I had to go through this period of time. I look at we just I just had five years since I launched my company, but I felt like the first five years of business was just learning how to do it to be able to just start. <laughs> so I had to go through that period of time of learning just to get started, <laughs> as opposed to like working for like Reebok or some other company to be able to launch an active company. So it was literally just like we have no clue what we're doing. Let's sell some shirts out of the back of the car and work as hard as we possibly can to make sure that this thing doesn't fail. And it was you know five hundred dollars and just racking up, you know, building up my credit card line, like over five years of time and just continuously building that that way and reinvesting in the business and not paying myself for almost four years to get to the point of starting. <laughs> so it was not, it was not fun. It was super, it was, it was a humble process of getting knocked down and having to get back up again. But that's part of the reason one of our core values is resilience and just getting up and keeping moving no matter what the opposition brings you. And it just builds this, like I said, firm foundation that is longevous than rather than just, you know, we blew up overnight and this was fun. <laughs> I just, I, I'm just cracking up at the, Hey, I bought a bunch of gym equipment and I thought I was going to open a gym and I got some shirt screen printed. And then I was like, you know what? I want to coach people. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. It's like, I, I thought it was fun, but like, I don't know. Part of me, I like, I was I coached a lot of hours at the gym I was working at um, back home, and I think maybe I got burned out on it. Um, yeah. And I liked I liked doing yeah. that, but every time, but as it got, it got to a point where every time that I was coaching was time I wasn't building my business. So I was just like, man, I don't know that I like this that much, <laughs> you know. And I, I I love people, I love that that kind of thing, but it, and I love fitness, but I don't know what it <laughs> I don't know what it was. I just didn't really enjoy it at a point. So it was interesting. Oh man, that. <laughs> Look, I uh, I did the gym route uh, for five and a half years, and uh, yeah. granted, I got back into coaching, but very different, more so right. um, elite athletes and those types of things. And that's just a very different, like that's a very different approach than teaching someone how to air squat for the first time, or yeah. right. you know what I'm saying. Uh, and mm-hmm. They, they each have their different things, and I think I look back and I say, man, if I never had that experience to teach someone how to air squat, I may have not understood and gained perspective on how to communicate with people. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. like looking at what I have the opportunity to do now, even this call, uh, you know, or this podcast today rather, it's the art of communication. It's it's mm-hmm. learning those things. It's learning how to listen. It's learning how to take feedback. It's learning how to provide that mm-hmm. feedback in, uh, in in the course of a conversation. And I I often think, man, if I if I didn't coach the regular Joe and the regular Jane, I mm-hmm. I, I think I would have missed out on learning mm-hmm. those things. And it's like I feel like some sometimes you got to go through those things, and yeah. it, and they're like and it just. It's uh, it's like Gary Vee says. It's like this. Uh, it's like a both and situation, right? Mm-hmm. So here's kind of how I look at it. It's like there's the there's the um, you know have the macro vision, but also do the micro little things. And what I've found is 
you you just can't speed up that process. Like the process is mm-hmm. going to take what it's just going to take. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 flush that out. The refinement process in your life is going to take what it's going to take. There ain't there ain't no speeding it up. No. At least I haven't found a way to do it. Like it's no, just man. gonna take what it's gonna take. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, is that I mean, is that your perspective? Like, I feel like building anything, building a, a business, yeah. building a competition, building this this brand that I'm I'm currently building now. It's like, dude, it it's gonna take what it's gonna yeah. take. Period. No matter what. No, no matter, matter what. what. And and I, I think that that has been the biggest thing for me. And a word that I constantly remind myself is patience, right? Consistency over time equals growth. And if you commit to the process day in and day out, you're going to see outcomes. But realistically, as individ- as humans, we we see an outcome for maybe 10 seconds. And then we're on to the next outcome, right? Like we're never going to be satisfied. And that's perfectly fine because we are created for constant progress and growth in our life. And yeah. to constantly be becoming a better version of ourself. Yeah, so true. I think for me, that process is something that you have to learn to fall in love with. And if you don't, you're literally just going to hate every minute of it, right? And you're going to be stressed out. You're going to be like, what's the next step? What's the next step? Where am I going? But you just have to be, you have to be patient. You have to be patient that point A to point B is not going to take as long as you hoped it would. It's going to take 10 times longer Mm. and maybe then some more, but you will get there eventually. You just got to keep sowing seeds in the right direction and then just waiting for that, that, you know, waiting for it to grow. And, um, Commit to that every single day. Never look back. As people, we always, the way social media has built us to be is like instant gratification or like Mm. if I need something, I'm just going to hop on Google and then order it from Amazon, right? Like that's the process, but that's not how we are created. Like we've created those things to make life easier for us, but the act of real growth and change is going to take years and years and years and years to happen. You look at Nike, it took them 20 years to go public, right? Lululemon, same thing, right? All these companies, like I'm on year five. I'm a little baby. Like, you know, like, so that process to get from where we want to go, where we are to where we want to go, like, it's going to take some freaking time. And you got to be ready for the long term outcome because nothing you want is going to come overnight. There was, um, uh, um, I don't know if you know who this is, Matt Torres. Um, he, he coaches yeah, Dallin and yeah, Emma and Danielle. Anyways, he, he sent me this video yesterday and, uh, I, I loved it so much. It it was, and I don't remember the guy's name because he. It's not like he's super popular, but he was, um, one of the CEOs of Nike. Uh, yeah. and the guy asked him, you know, that was videoing him. He said, "What did you learn in your time in Nike, and what do you believe made Nike successful?" And he said a lot of things in this 30 second clip uh, that was really good. I'll send it to you after we're done. Mm -hmm. I think you would find it interesting. But he said something that stuck out to me. So we said two things, really. He said the first thing, and hold on, I actually wrote this down because, like, that's like you, you know, it's impactful when I write it down. I, I I don't, (laughs) man. Like, I I stopped the video and then I said, I got to write something. He said, at Nike, we always served the athletes. He mm. said, we listened to them, or excuse me, we made products for them. We listened to them. We got feedback from them, and then we iterated on that. And the purpose of that was to serve the athletes. How we created the buy-in was by telling emotional stories about yeah. the athletes that featured our products. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. It's just, you know, sometimes you're, right place right time and you hear the right thing and that was like it for me yesterday i was like oh that was good right it's so simple it's it's so freaking simple but yeah the reason that i love that is because i see a lot of that and i and i'm and i'm hearing a lot i'm getting a lot of those vibes from the things that uh you're saying and i and i just even from the hey we're starting local and then we're going you know mr worldwide but we're gonna start local first Uh, yeah. You know, we're not we're we're, we're not interested in the biggest, baddest CrossFit athlete, yeah. just to slap our name and brand. And I and I I freaking love how you said we want to actually add value. We want to have a line a a brand that adds value to that person's life. Like I freaking love that. Like I mean, 
Yeah. People aren't thinking that way. People are just thinking, screw it. We just need to slap that logo Ooh, right on the chest piece. Let's go. Right. I mean, yeah. to mm-hmm. me, it's so different than what I hear every single day. And I can clearly see, I mean, I and I've, I'm not everyone gets the chance to have an hour conversation with you, but I can clearly see why what you're doing is different. Yeah. Yeah, man. I think, I mean, how many athletes do you see that, that work on behalf of brands that don't even that are drinking the product on the front line and then drinking a different product behind the scenes because they don't even like it, right? I mean, I've I've heard stories of that and that's pretty gnarly, man. Like, you know, and as a brand, that's not that's not what I want. That's not what I want. Like, I want, as you know, you talk about the buy-in, right? You want people to buy into the message and the story and you want them to work on behalf of you because they believe in what you're doing so much so that they're willing to do it even if they weren't getting paid, mm. right? And I want to take care of you because I want to invest in you and I believe in what you're doing and I want to help you to get to where you want to go in your life. But like there has to be a commitment to the message that's overwhelming and not just because I'm trying to collect a paycheck, Mm -hmm. right? Or whatever that is, you know, we need money to survive. But like I said, purpose is a much, much better form of payment than money itself, right? Mm -hmm. So that buy-in is, is, is super important. Um, to the message and to the mission of what you're doing Um, because that is what creates longevity and alignment with life Mm. so look man as we as we wrap up here i want to just kind of get an idea like what is uh, lrx looking at for the future like i I know there's obviously there's probably things that you can't talk about or whatever and and i I get Mm -hmm. that too but um like what uh, I guess, what can people be excited about? Because I mean, I I'm rather new to the brand. I'll, 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 again, just very transparent. I'm, I'm I'm rather new to the brand, but like already, I I see why the people that have your stuff and wear your stuff mm-hmm. on a regular basis talk about it profusely. Like I like now yeah. I now I get it. You know, like I get mm-hmm. it. Like it's why I have every single pair of Lululemon underwear. I literally yeah. not exaggerating. Yeah. I literally literally have 30 pairs i'm not exaggerating yeah. i could not do laundry for like two weeks because <laughs> i am that obsessive about yeah like like i am such a big fan and yeah it's so weird that that's like i talk about my lululemon, lululemon underwear that way and the people that interact with your brand uh even if you guys sent my brother some stuff and I and he was mm-hmm. like, man, I just love this stuff. It's so great. It, it feels yeah. so great, you know. Right. And I'm like, dude, it's just clothes. Like, right? Like, like, cause I I don't get it. But then it's like you put on the Lululemon underwear, and you're like, oh, but I do get it. Let me tell yeah. you. Yeah. Anyways, um, I would say what they have to look forward to is products that match the message in terms of stories that are going to be aligned with campaigns that we're creating, but production lines and actual products that are tangible that people are going to love. Um, and they're going to add it into their wardrobe every single day, not only for, you know, just for working out, but for lifestyle in general, we create clothing that you can train, live and rest in. So stuff you want to wear anywhere. Um, programs for athletes and community members that are actually going to help them in their life, get from point A to point B. I have a really big vision for what athlete sponsorships are going to look like in the future for what we're doing. I'm excited to walk down that path. We're kind of in the the infancy stage of what that's going to look like, but I'm excited for that to come to fruition. You're going to see content that is really, really solid in terms of the way that it's messaged um, and communicated. And it's just going to be a brand that creates a better experience than other brands create in our industry. That's going to be really, really focused on how to help you become a better version of yourself in your life. So not only is it going to be a product, but the product is actually going to be embodied as something that's going to be a call to action to a better quality of life for yourself, Mm -hmm. along with a community and a brand that really does care about you as an individual and is not just there to to have you swipe your credit card. Um, You're going to have a family that's connected to the brand. So that's the desire and that's what we're looking to carry out. And we've been that way since we started. You're going to see us um, integrated more into the Midwest and the areas there. Uh, You're going to see us integrated more into the South. Um, and then also into the Southwest and that's going to be people, not only from a brand perspective and seeing people wearing the clothing, you're going to see faces and people at your local events. Um, and you're going to see the brand continue to grow that way, but then you're also going to see us grow, um, on a bigger scale as well from an e-commerce perspective. And then also working with athletes that you know, and and love. So, Mm. yeah, man, I, yeah, I love that. That's awesome, dude. Um, yeah. 
thank you for your time, man. Thank you, yeah, thank, you thank you, thank you. I, I, this was fun. I, I got to like scratch my marketing itch. I got to scratch <laughs> my philosophical itch. I got to scratch. Oh, I like I, I scratch some itches today. You know, what I'm, saying? <laughs> I'm so, glad I could help. <laughs> scratch, scratch my underwear itch. <laughs> You gotta tell people what you're wearing, man. <laughs> hey, man. Look, man. I, look, I shouldn't have said that. You know, now, now, I, now I need a sponsorship because you know. Yeah, look, right. <laughs> I mean, I gave him. I gave some free. You, you, know, said, you said thirty pairs of underwear, bro. That's a lot of money. Free he clout, spent bro. Six hundred dollars on underwear. <laughs> no, look, bro. My look. My wife knows every every like uh, holiday, every whatever. I, whatever I need, it is. I need a three pack of pair of underwear. Yeah, man. Monday comes around, you're like, honey, I need a three pack. Where's it at? <laughs> like, I want all the colors, all the designs. I don't I it. I, like it, it's it, it's like, yeah, the, the only um, example I could probably give it's how some people are. And I'm not going to say the name because I'm not giving any more free clout to anybody. You can probably know the brand I'm thinking of the sock company that yep. is very popular. Um, <laughs> anyways, so. And they actually do underwear too, by the way. Yeah, um, there you go. I've never tried theirs, but uh, <laughs> anywho, Ryan, yeah, uh, I'll put all your stuff in the bio. People, if you're listening, okay. go on there. I mean, check out. Seriously, like I, I, I did it the other day because I was, I was curious about what it is that LRX offers, and um, you owe it to yourself to go on there and, 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 and check it out. Like I, I genuinely mean that he's not paying me to say that. I, I just mean, yeah, I think yeah. when you connect a person, um, to not, not just a brand, but as, as, as he talked about a, a person to a purpose, it's, it's, it's powerful. And then I think the brand embodies that. And that's why I got excited about this conversation. And I, and I hope that the people listening, you know, you just take three seconds to click on the link or whatever, follow them on, on IG, or hit up Ryan and be like, hey, I heard, heard you on the podcast, whatever. Just because I, I think yeah. one thing that I know now about you, and I, and I think this just makes it even that much better, is that you genuinely want to connect with people. And I, and I think mm -hmm. that makes the whole situation just, I don't know, to me that much sweeter because I, cause like I know yeah. the person behind it. And um, yeah. I, I, I like Appreciate supporting that, brands like that. So, yeah. Yeah, man. It's been great. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, dude. Appreciate you. Thanks for listening to Brute Strength Podcast. As always, you can head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com to connect with us and access the links and resources mentioned in this podcast. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com for exclusive content and giveaways just for you, our podcast listeners. Consider subscribing so you never miss out. That's all for this episode. See you next time.